So what kind of progress is being made in the fight to end discrimination against those with albinism? I spoke to someone on the front line, Susan Dubois, not only has two children with the condition, but she and her husband travel to Africa every year as advocates on this issue. I asked her what needs to be done right now. There, there are three major issues that we really need to work on, and one is public awareness, and that is not just awareness of people with albinism, but also people in their community, the family members as well as community members. They need to learn what albinism is, and then also what it is not. It is not a curse, it is not magic, it is not bad luck. And by dispelling those myths, we hope then to ease the treatment of people with albinism across their communities. And the second thing we have to do is to bring supplies like sunscreen, hats, long sleeves, and sunglasses to people with albinism. And when I first started traveling to Africa about six years ago, I would find mothers putting sunscreen on their babies at night. They were, they were using it as lotion rather than as a sun protectant during the day. So we have to educate them about how to protect themselves from the sun. And the third thing we really need to work on is creating educational and employment opportunities for people with albinism, because the only way to really integrate them into their communities is to help them become valuable members of their communities through schooling and through employment. The numbers, uh, just shocking, for every 100,000 people, something like 5 to 20 mm -hmm. uh, born with this condition. Uh, when mm -hmm. you talk about minorities, uh, you don't get much more uh, minority than that. Uh, why are international rules to protect them so new, do you think? I think it's because awareness is growing. And even though it is a rare condition and there aren't you know, wide numbers of people with albinism, one out of 19 Africans carries a gene for, for albinism. In Tanzania, it's, it's, been, it's been researched and proven that one out of 19 people has the gene. In our country, it's one out of 70. So while it is a rare condition, we all know someone who carries the gene. So it's important to teach people about genetic disabilities and about these kind of conditions so that they'll be more accepting across a wide spectrum of issues. You and your husband are on the ground in Africa quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, are these rules enough? I mean, obviously, it, it needs to go further, doesn't it? Well, the international rules are certainly not enough, but they're a good starting point. They raise awareness, and they actually create a platform for discussing the issues on a country-by-country -country level. So what we need to do now is we're working with different countries on how to use the laws they already have on the books to protect people with albinism, but also to prosecute people who, who, who commit crimes against people with albinism. Because even though there are certain rules on the books, they're not always enforced. In fact, in Malawi in the last year and a half, there have been 80 attacks on people with albinism. Only 20 cases have been brought to trial. And out of the 18 murders in Malawi in the last year and a half, only two people have been, have been prosecuted and brought to trial. So we need a greater understanding of how to use the laws that already exist, as well as extending them to protect people in the, with albinism. As a mother of two who are dealing with this, uh, you came up with this guide to the early years back in mm -hmm. 2008. Um, where was that person at that time and today? And, and talk to us about the journey and what you've learned along the way. Well, people often would ask me, why did I title the book A Guide to the Early Years? And my answer was, because my son's only seven. I don't know anything past that. And so I think that the, where, I, where I am now is in a much calmer, much better place. I mean, it's, you know, our children can do anything, and they, they really are just like you and I. And that's our central message, that people with albinism are just like you and I. And I think that watching my children grow and develop and try new things has been a wonderful, wonderful affirmation for me that people with albinism can do anything. What about uh, the, the, the effort underway, your husband in Tanzania as mm -hmm. we speak? Um, it, I know it's a, it's a long, tough slog in many mm -hmm. respects. What's it going to take to kind of turn the tide in terms of culturally uh, a different acceptance? I think it's going to take education, like widespread systemic education, but I think it's also going to take elevating people with albinism into positions of teachers, doctors, lawyers, and they, they already are in all of those positions, but I mean get many, many more people with albinism in those public positions so that society and as a whole can see that they can hold any job and they can do anything that they, that they want to do. Susan Dwyer, thanks so much. Thank you very much for your time.